Thank you for joining us for the first event in our Women Who Roar series of programs, which focuses on roaring women who have broken barriers and inspired women, just as Ruth Bader Ginsburg did, but in fields as diverse as visual art, music, and more. Today, Samantha Baskin, a professor of art history at Cleveland State University, will be joining us to speak about four different roaring women artists. Professor Baskin is the author of five books, most recently, The Warsaw Ghetto and American Art and Culture, and co-editor of the Jewish graphic novel, Critical Approaches, the foundational volume in the field. She has contributed more than 100 articles and reviews on a variety of subjects to museum catalogs, academic journals, added volumes, volumes, encyclopedias, and the popular press. She has served as editor for US art for the 22 volume revised edition of the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Judaica and is currently series editor of Dimunot, Jews and the Cultural Imagination, published by Penn University State Press. Her current book examines the 19th century Jewish American sculptor, Moses Jacob Ezekiel, who made the largest monument to religious liberty in America, as well as prominent prominent Confederate monuments, including 32 foot tall memorial in Arlington National Cemetery. And now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Samantha to the virtual stage. It's my pleasure to be here, Emma. Thank you for that kind introduction. Today, I wanna to look at a number of American artists who were trailblazers, just like RBG was. She helped facilitate historic change. She lived through it as did our four artists as well. And, you know, women who roar, we're gonna look at Ammonia Lewis, who is in the black and white photo, Judy Chicago, who is all rainbowed out, which is very much a part of her MO, then Audrey Flack is in the lower corner and Siona Benjamin. And these are women from, <clears throat> who really were successful in the 19th century, the 20th century, and taking us into the 21st century. We can't really talk about the 20th century and women in the 21st century without understanding how women were depicted in the past. And there aren't really women artists in the past. This is a Titian. This is a high Renaissance work of art. It's Venus of Urbino and it's from 1538. And it's a really interesting depiction that kind of sets the stage. Women are depicted as Venuses, as goddesses. Women are the subject of the gaze. And we see here this woman, you know, she is nude, she is gazing out at us, she knows that she's being looked at, she knows she's being worshipped. And a male made this particular painting. I could name dozens and hundreds of these kinds of paintings of the reclining female nude made by male artists <clears throat> from say the high renaissance up to the current time. So this woman, you know, she's she is a goddess, but she's also alluringly human. She has servants in the back who provide for her, who get her clothes. She lives in a palace. The female artists we will look at soon did not paint women this way at all. So now that you understand how women have been portrayed and didn't have a chance to portray themselves, we're gonna jump into the 20th century. And I imagine this particular work, this particular photograph is surprising. Um, these are the Gorilla Girls. And they really came to the forefront in 1984 when they found themselves dissatisfied with how women had been depicted in the art world. That women didn't have the chance to paint in the art world and they didn't get the recognition that they deserved even when they made art. So the, oh, and they're called gorilla girls. So they're gorilla as in warfare, but they wear gorilla masks. And so they expose sexual and racial discrimination. They make posters and other kinds of propaganda to call our attention to iniquity. So they protect their own identities by wearing these masks. The, who knows who they are? They're not, they're, they wanna be like the female counterpart to Zorro or Robin Hood or you know, those masked crusaders who fought for justice, but were always men. So they keep themselves anonymous and they really began doing what they wanted to do in response to the International Survey of Painting and Sculpture, which was in 1984 at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. They saw that 
women did, were underrepresented. There weren't a lot of women artists and women were shown in offensive ways sometimes. So this is the kind of propaganda that interests them. It's a poster that they made, it's from 1989. So do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? They were asked to do a billboard for the Public Art Fund in New York. They said, oh, this is a good chance to do something that will be seen by a large audience. So they went to the Met and they conducted what they called a weenie count. And they said the results were revealing. And there were very few nude males and a lot of female nudes, and they found this offensive. So this poster says, Less than 5% of the artists in the modern sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. The poster, the Public Art Fund didn't like it. They said it wasn't clear enough. So the Gorilla, Gorilla Girls rented some, like some billboard space and um, like they had the poster on some buses. But the buses said, this is a little bit too offensive. We can't have this on the buses. So it, was, it did run for a little bit. But the interesting thing is that the Guerrilla Girls appropriated a painting of a lounging female nude by Jean-Auguste Dominique Eng from, from 1814. It's the large Odalesque, and it's a really famous painting of a woman. So here we have her lounging. She's exoticized. It's 19th century, so we've jumped from Titian. And she's shown beautiful and gazing out at us. She has a very linear back. And she's shown as if she's in a harem, an odalesque. And that's what the Guerrilla Girls are playing off of. So they're taking how women have been shown in the past and using that as a weapon to get women the distinction that they should have, ideally, but it didn't quite work. Nevertheless, that's what the Guerrilla Girls are up to. In the 70s, we have the feminist art movement. And this is just a good example before we get to our main artists. It's a really interesting painting. It's Sylvia Slay's The Turkish Bath. So she's thinking about Aang and his elongated backs with the gentleman on the far left with a guitar. And she's thinking about all the women who have been portrayed in art, nude. And she shows all of these lounging male nudes, you know, lounging, sitting there, and it's very much of its moment. These are definitely men of the 1970s. So she, she makes this work. And of course, it's, it's uncomfortably viewed by many. We're used to seeing female nudes. We're not used to seeing male nudes. So this is challenging the conventions of Western art. To go back to the Guerrilla Girls briefly, this is from 1988, and it's one of their posters that they made. And they would you know, post them um, in different places. They ultimately are now in museums. And they're like the Tate Museum in London has a beautiful display of Guerrilla Girls posters. The Guerrilla Girls call themselves the conscience of the art world, which you can see down in the bottom corner of this poster. But I think the most, what this, this poster can really also help us understand what the problems are of being a woman artist, why women did not make a lot of art in the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, even 19th. And it's not because they weren't great artists. They probably could have been great artists. They didn't have the opportunities, both then and even in the 20th century and to some extent now. So the advantages of being a woman artist, working without the pressure of success, not having to be in shows with men, you know, this is all tongue in cheek. Having an escape from the art world in your four freelance jobs. Knowing your career might pick up after you're 80. You get the idea. So in being reassured that whatever kind of art you make, it will be labeled feminine. And that's true to this day. Um, and then the final one here at the bottom, of the list is getting your picture in the art magazines wearing a gorilla suit. So these, they're, they're very funny. And they said, we want to be funny because we want people to realize that feminists aren't you know, serious. We're real people, we can be funny. Take us, you know, take us seriously because we're whole, right? We're well-rounded. Which brings us to the 19th century and one of the featured artists, which, who is Edmonia Lewis. Edmonia Lewis was born, she, she's, she's an interest, she's a, here's why she's a trailblazer. She was both black 
and Native Americans. She had a Native American mom and a father who was, he was in America, but from, from Haiti. And she was, the family was born free. So this family was born free, but Lewis really felt the pain of her people. Her original name was Wildfire. And at four years old, she was orphaned. Her aunts in the Chippewa community raised her. So she surpassed every odd to become a famous sculptor. She's in the Smithsonian, you know, when you make gigantic sculptures in marble, you don't have, you know, you can't make a huge body of work, but she made a tremendous body of work that we know about. A lot of works are lost, are missing. We can't put together her entire, we can't reconstruct everything that she did. But she, nevertheless, she surpassed all odds. She became the first African-American female sculptor and the first Native American sculptor. She shattered every expectation about what women and minority artists could accomplish. And just to connect her to um, Ohio for a second, she um, went to Oberlin. She had the opportunity for an education. Her brother was very successful, gave her money, and that allowed her to pursue an education, but it wasn't so easy. She did go to Oberlin, but she suffered from discrimination, unsurprisingly, but even worse, she was accused of poisoning two of her friends. They all had a drink one night together and two of the friends, female, of course, got sick and she was accused of, and they were very sick. She had the same drink, but didn't get sick. So she was accused of that. Everyone was suspicious. They said, of course she did this. She's, you know, she's a minority. She was ultimately found not guilty, but still she was attacked severely and left to die, beaten and left to die. Her body, she was found, she survived. She was then accused of stealing art materials and was kicked out of school. So she was just a few credits shy of finishing her education. But she, she had a little bit of art training at Oberlin. She goes to ultimately to Boston. She still has minimal art training, but she aspires to be a sculptor in marble, which is a very male profession and a challenging profession because when you're a painter, you just get a canvas and you can paint something. But marble has to be financed. You can't just play around with a piece of marble. So she gets a little bit of training. She realizes that discrimination in America is too much for her. And she eventually goes to Rome and she has a career in Rome. So she's an expat artist. This is Forever Free. It's from 1867 and it's not very big. It's only three feet tall. She's gonna, we're gonna see a much larger sculpture in just a bit. It's her first major sculpture. She did it about a year after she arrived in Rome. And she, which it's an emancipation theme. What she's trying to convey here is this is a newly emancipated couple. Yet the man who's a, her, you know, a heroic, a beautiful sort of neoclassical nude is holding up his chain because he's really not free. He's free, but he's not. And so that shackle is symbolic for her. Those, those sculptors who worked in marble and there were a lot of men in Europe who did that. Some of you may be familiar with the American Hiram Powers who worked in Europe um, as an expat, but, and, and, he, and he helped in Monia Lewis. He tried to nurture her career a little bit, but typically sculptors would make a plaster clay, clay and then plaster, and then they would have stone cutters actually chisel the marble but women were accused of having no talent if they hired stone cutters. So Lewis did not hire a stone cutter and she also really couldn't afford it. This is another example of her work. She, again, she, as a woman, she was interested in themes depicting women. This is Hagar. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the story of Hagar from Genesis. Hagar was an enslaved Egyptian woman. She was the mother of Abraham's first son, Ishmael. And in this case, we're seeing Hagar, she's been banished by the, the patriarch Abraham into the desert. And it's a very empathetic, you know, empathetic portrayal of Hagar. 
And again, we looked at the advantages of being a woman artist. Well, one is your work is always looked at through the lens of you know, your femininity. And perhaps in some cases this is true and perhaps some not. And in this case, we think it's true. We're not just reading too much into it. So she depicts Hagar at the moment she encounters God in the desert. We can see her sort of, her hands are clasped some, somewhat in prayer, looking to the heavens, you know, they might be clasped in determination as well. Ishmael's not here. And we think that Lewis might've not shown Ishmael because she was interested in focusing on the woman, on the female, on the female's experience here. So there's stillness in that she's quiet and looking to the heavens, but at the same time, there's a sense of resolve. She's striding forward. We have to look at her whole body. And just to repeat this idea of neoclassicism, it's a moment in art history where artists are looking to the classical past. We see a lot of drapery. We see the use of marble, which was highly popular during the Renaissance. Another example of Lewis's work is Cleopatra, and it's from 1876, which is the centennial. She made, it's, it's a beautiful work. It's in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. She worked on this for four years, and it's, it's huge, it's 3,000 pounds. It's in marble, and we see Cleopatra, the legendary queen of Egypt, at her moment of death. She's, she had a very dramatic suicide, and she um, allegedly from a fatal bite of a poisonous snake, she chose this. And we see her in the moment after death. She's in her royal attire and in sort of a majestic, you know, repose in her throne. There's, you might, there's identical sphinx heads on either side of the throne and there's some hieroglyphics, but they don't make sense. It's just, you know, symbolic. So, so at this moment, the Cleopatra is a, a common subject in the 19th century, but certainly not shown at the moment of her death. And she's not idealized as she would typically be. Critics didn't like this. One critic called it ghastly, um, another absolutely repellent. Um, but then the Centennial Exhibition is going to be in Philadelphia in 1876. Lewis was very ambitious. As I said, she's incredibly trailblazing and she submitted it for the, for the expo exposition. But it's not like she could send a PowerPoint slide or a photograph. She found the money to have this 3,000 pound sculpture shipped to Philadelphia. And it was very widely praised. It was loved. It was widely seen at the exhibition. One, one critic raved that it was the best American artwork, art sculpture in the entire exhibition. But then like much of her work, it was lost to history for quite some time. So it was shown in the expo exposition and then disappears. The, it was ultimately traced, it was in a Chicago bar, a saloon for a while as decoration. Then it disappeared from there and was at a suburban racetrack in Chicago. And that racetrack closed down. And then it ended up in storage, like in a salvage yard. Some Boy Scouts saw it, they thought they should help it out. They spray painted it. And then ultimately the Smithsonian American Art Museum found it, they bought it and it's been conserved and it's terrific. And, um, and Monia Lewis has, she was forgotten to history but she's, you know, she's been found. There's a really great book about her now. Um, and this is a Google Doodle. And this Google Doodle, Doodle featured her during African-American History Month. So here we see her chiseling Cleopatra. We're jumping really far ahead now. This is 20th century feminist art. Judy Chicago is probably the artist that's most familiar to the audience today. In the 1970s, female artists felt that we're going to assert ourselves. And so, as we know, feminism was at its, you know, was really pushing boundaries at that time. And artists said, we female artists want to join this movement. And it was a moment of multi multiculturalism, minds were beginning to open. And, you know, the feminists take a hard line against, you know, the male orientation of the world and feminist artists do that in the art world 
as well. So they're chiefly concerned with definitions of the female body, like the painting we saw by Sylvia Slay. And Judy Chicago is really at the forefront of this movement. We think she coined the term feminist art. So she's interested in social issues of gender and the cultural critique of difference. Judy Chicago is Jewish. She was Judy Cohen. And she decides at her first exhibition that she doesn't want to be Judy Cohen. She was actually married. She was Judy Garowitz at that point. She wanted to divest herself of all names given to her by the patriarchy. So she puts a poster to that nature up at her first show and says, my name is Judy Chicago. And Chicago is the city of her birth. And in choosing that, she's going, um, she's looking backwards to the Renaissance, like Leonardo da Vinci is Leonardo from Vinci. And just Judy Chicago is her name. It's a defiant act that defined her and really defines her art. So she makes very major projects that take years to complete. This project took from 74 to 79 to complete. But before we talk about the dinner party, I just want to mention a different work. There are photographs of it, but I felt like I felt like it might not be a good idea to show them. And here's why. So in 1972, Judy Chicago, along with Miriam Shapiro, who is another Jewish woman who's at the forefront of the feminist art movement, decided to start um, a feminist art program at the California Institute of the Arts. So women get, the, get more opportunities. Women are going to depict themselves. So they start a whole program similar to, let's say, Jewish art programs are only a new phenomena. In the 90s, we finally have programs that are focused solely on teaching Jewish art so, and making Jewish art. So this is the, the project I'm talking about is called Woman House from 72, made with Miriam Shapiro. And the two of them with their students actually got a house in which women could display their work. And Women House had a month exhibition called Menstruation Bathroom. And it was in the actual bathroom of the house that openly displayed tampons and sanitary napkin boxes, as well as used red products in and around the trash can. So just bear with me. This all could be seen from like a gauze covered doorway. So it's an installation that visitors had to come see. The point of it is that it was a comment on the secret veiled manner by which women were forced to deal with this natural biological function. And that makes male societies uncomfortable. So this is how the feminist artists are really pushing boundaries. So the dinner party, which some of you may be familiar with, is huge. It's 48 feet aside. It's a huge triangle. And it's a massive ceremonial dinner party comprised of women. It's a seminal feminist artwork. And the goal of it is to bring women's history to the forefront and celebrate women. It was, it was a collaboration of more than 400 women. So Judy Chicago, in essence, ran a workshop to get this completed. And it, it tells of women's achievements and struggles at the same time. So eat, there's a place setting for each woman. And this is a detail so you can see what I'm talking about. At the beginning, we have the primordial goddess and the fertile goddess. And it makes its way chronologically around the table and along the way, we have like Sojourner Truth and Artemisia Gentileschi, who was a 17th century female artist who did make a career for herself. And ultimately at the end, the last art, the last figure is Georgia O'Keeffe. Susan B. Anthony's in there as well. So here we each place setting, and you can see the primordial goddess has a hand painted china plate. It has a has ceramic cutlery, a chalice, a napkin. Well, let's look at a detail. Oh, we'll get back to the detail in a second. Here, the floor is also covered with names of women who are important, but didn't you know quite did there wasn't room to have all of them at the dinner party. This is called the heritage floor. So these are other women names. It's almost a thousand. One male name got in there by accident. Here we can see her workshop. Um, there were a few men in the workshop, it was more women. And just to focus on one place setting, let's look at Georgia O'Keeffe. And this is the study that Chicago made for Georgia O'Keeffe's plate. So she would make studies for every single plate. And 
then these ceramicists would make them. So Chicago conceptualizes, but then she had people working for her with the 39 place settings around the table. So 13 on a side. And here's a drawing that she made of the plate. The vulva kind of vaginal forms that she used were criticized. So some critics didn't like that. They thought it was stereotyping, but Chicago's taking back the stereotype. And here's the actual place setting. You can see some names on the heritage floor. You can also see the ceramic plate, it's upraised. Some are just painted, some are ceramic and upraised. The beautiful embroidered place setting with Georgia O'Keeffe's name on it. And this exhibition was hugely popular. It's huge, but it would move, it went to different cities. And in San Francisco at the Museum of Modern Art in 79, 100,000 people saw it. And for Clevelanders who are listening, it was mounted in an exhibit in Cleveland Heights. And this, this always astounds me when I found this out. It, it's huge, so it needs to have a big space. It was mounted at the former Temple of the Heights on Lee Road, and thousands of people flocked to see it. The dinner party you know, was fragile, so it couldn't travel forever, and it needed a permanent space. In um, 1981, they were, the, um, Judy Chicago and others were looking for a permanent space. Well, they came to Cleveland and said, we'd like you to house this. Cleveland did not step up to the plate, just like Cleveland didn't step up to the plate when offered the Salvador Dali exhibition, um, permanent museum. So ultimately, oh, here's the Emily Dickinson place setting. You know, the place setting also has a flavor of the time. This is very, you know, frilly and lace and it's beautiful. It evokes Emily Dickinson. So this is where the dinner party is now. It's in the Brooklyn Museum of Art in the Sackler Feminist Art section of the museum. And it's beautiful, it's very dark and well lit and you walk around it. When I went to see this in person, I like wanted to jump over the um, rope hangings and bars because I just wanted to get closer. But so this is where it is. It, you can go see it if you go to the Brooklyn Museum of Art which has a fabulous art collection separate from the dinner party as well. So years after she made this, and she's made other large scale installations, the Holocaust Project is another that she did, which is about the Holocaust, but it also pays special attention to the women, women's experience in the Holocaust. And that came to Cleveland when it was traveling, it's just, it's even bigger than this. And it was at the Contemporary Art Center back in the day, this is the 90s. So after the fact, Chicago um, realized, she said, she wrote this, that her desire to fight injustice for women and in general was to, and these are her words, affect a transformation of consciousness through art, which relates to her religio-cultural heritage. In other words, she says this relates to tikkun, healing, tikkun olam, the heal of the world. She asserts that this is what she, the reason, the impetus, her Jewish heritage compelled her to make this kind of art. So to move on to another artist who I'm especially fond of, this is Audrey Flack's work. This is Jolie Madame from 1972. Audrey, she's my good friend. Um, she turns 90, otherwise I just call her Flack, but sometimes I mess up and call her Audrey because we're very close. She turns 90 this year and she still goes to her studio every day and makes art. And she had a documentary made about her life and her work that came out before COVID, but it didn't get to travel as much as we'd hoped. It was supposed to be at the Cedar Lee. It couldn't make it because of COVID, but she is a force of nature. So she is the kind of, what we call her style is photorealism or photorealist art. And here we have a painting that she, this is a painting. It looks like a photograph. This is a painting that she made. Her ability to create reflections off glass and you know, jewelry and light and off the table beneath her is she, incredible. She is a, she's an amazing artist. And so she initially, you know, when she first decided to work as a photorealist and there's a move, there was a movement, a group of artists. So she's the only female photorealist. So she worked among a group of men and she's interested, she would, you know, set up still lives of configurations of objects, which is not what the men did. She focused on pretty objects. She liked beautiful feminine things. And that's what she depicted. 
And this differs from her male counterparts. Her male counterparts painted buildings and cities and cars and motorcycles. Again, she focuses on beautiful things. Some critics saw this unfavorably, <clears throat> but she said she didn't want to coolly paint neutral content derived from photographs, typical of her male peers. She said, I want to make illusionistic canvases that plumb my identity, my identity as a woman, as a Jew, she's Jewish, and as a mother. These were her three identity markers that meant so much to her. So to compare, this is what her male counterparts were painting. This is from 72, just like the painting I showed you. And you know, they painted buses and cities. It's still a tour de, tour de force of technique, but it is very different in content. So again, as you can see, as opposed to Jolie Madame. She, oh, and Audrey also makes a lot of works with Jewish content. She's interested in her Jewish identity. She has, she makes sculptures now. She doesn't paint as much as she used to. She made a gigantic sculpture of Eve and other women, um, goddesses, Egyptian goddesses, women who were strong. And she, so she made Eve. She has painted actually the Virgin Mary because she said, the Virgin Mary's pain as a mother is the most potent pain of, of a mother in the entire Bible. And Audrey said, I can relate to that pain. And she does have two daughters and one is autistic and never could speak. So Audrey very, feels very passionate about other women who have suffered and been so sad because of their children. So one more Audrey Flack is in order, I think. This is Marilyn Vanitas It's from 1977. Audrey made three gigantic paintings. Um, they were eight feet square. It's a perfect square, which is not typical of this time. But you know, normally you have elongated horizontal canvases or vertical canvases. But she was really interested in this you know, very square format. This is fully painted. Just to be clear, this is not a photograph. It's derived from objects that Audrey puts together, takes a photograph of, projects the photograph on a wall and or on a canvas and then paints. She has this on the canvas and she uses a she uses an air spray gun to paint these. And she hasn't done air spray in years. And now she uses a brush or she does drawings or as I said, she makes sculptures. So we have these three Vanitas paintings that are all eight feet square. One of them is one of them is World War II Vanitas. So it's a work that um, looks at the Holocaust. But this one drew in, you know, they, oh, they all draw, draw inspiration from Baroque still life allegories. But this one draws inspiration from really the cult of Marilyn Monroe. How Marilyn Monroe was worshiped for so long for her beauty. And Flack has a different take on this. So she paints this canvas with lush and really intense colors. And it has a very high gloss surface. Um, and we have Marilyn, we have her as Norma Jean before she becomes that harsh, brittle blonde of Hollywood. And she's like, she's as yet, yet uncorrupted by turning into a sexual being, not, not her, but what men did to her. And that's a black and white photograph that Flack has reproduced with her spray gun. So she's, she's interested in Marilyn's ephemality. We have a hourglass. At the bottom, we have a goblet with pearls, you know, beautiful pearls coming out of it. She's, you know, we have her makeup here and lipstick and all the, the beautifying things that women do to themselves. So it's a flawless painting. If you ever have an opportunity to see these in person, the Vanitas or any flack. Oh, there are several flacks at the um, Butler Museum of American Art in Youngstown. You could see one of her photorealist paintings there as well as a sculpture that she has there. So at the same time, Flack makes comment on herself. The small photograph of the girl and boy toward near the blue goblet is a photograph of her and her brother. And she's really, she's saying something about her own vulnerability as a girl and ultimately as a woman. Our final artist that I wanna talk about is Siona Benjamin. And she is, she, she's making a name, Audrey still makes work, Judy Chicago still makes work. 
Siona Benjamin is of the next generation. She's 60 years old and she's a really fascinating figure. She has, <clears throat> hold on, I need a drink. <clears throat> she's been <clears throat> making this kind of intricately detailed art for decades. She is feminist, she is Jewish, she has a political bent, and she has a fascinating background. She is, she was born in India, in a very in Catholic Zoroastrian India, but she was raised an observant Jew. There are, there are centuries of Jews in India, but we don't really know this. You know, this isn't to the forefront of our consciousness. So she is Jewish, she practices Judaism, she came to America for graduate for school, for college and graduate school, and she stayed. And what she does is her identity, her identity markers are Jewish, feminist, um, South Asian, and so forth. And what she's interested in is how women have found representation through the ages, and she wants to put them in the place that she thinks they should be. In other words, here we have Lilith. Lilith being the um, first wife, legendary first wife of Adam, and that Adam you know, that was cast out of Eden because she wouldn't be subservient to Adam. So, you know, according to Babylonian legend, that's the case. Um, Lilith is a big presence in American culture now. The strong woman who refused to be subservient was kind of taken up in different realms. Lilith Magazine is a real important feminist Jewish magazine in our country that used Lilith as its you know, figurehead. Then there's the Lilith Fair from the 90s, females who created their own music fair because they weren't getting as much representation as they thought they should. So Benjamin's interested in Lilith too. And this, is, this painting is part of a series called the Finding Home series. This is number 74 and it's Fereshti, which is finding home, which means angels in Urdu. Because Siona knows, and I know her as well, otherwise I, I'll try and just call her Benjamin if I can recall, if remember, um, it, we know this is Lilith. Lilith is written in Hebrew at the bottom. She knows Hindi, she uses different languages in her art. So here we have Lilith standing proud with a talus over her head. And she says in a speech bubble, Clearly this is influenced by cartoons. A thousand years have I waited, keeping the embers of revenge glowing in my heart. So she's some Indian comics from her childhood influenced her in making this work as well. And <clears throat> here she has Lilith finally speaking, you know, speaking up, speaking forward for all those years that she was, you know, she was demonized. She was demonized that she, Killed, she killed babies in childbirth, that she you know, destroyed men. And you know, this is no fault of her own. All of this for being an ancient egalitarian doesn't seem right. So Benjamin feels that scripture can convey her feminist sensibilities. She makes works on Rebecca, Sarah, and so forth. I just wanted to look at a couple Liliths today because I'm in a Lilith frame of mind these days. Now, global crises also fuel Benjamin's artistic muse. So this woman is standing up for herself, but at the same time, she's Lilith, but she stands for all women. And that's really interesting idea to Benjamin that she wants her women to be universal, even as they're Jewish or not. Like her interest in blue relates to the um, Hindi god Krishna, who was shown as blue. And we see a khamsa around Lilith's neck and a khamsa belongs to different cultures. Um, khamsa is both Ju relates to Judaism and Islam. The snake armband is a reference to Hinduism. So, and then there's the Jewish prayer shawl, of course. So she has various religious symbols because she wants Lilith, Lilith to stand for all women. She's she hopes to universalize the human experience. So she's interested in our commonalities, not our differences. So again, this, this Lilith can stand as any targeted woman as much as she stands for herself. And there's one more Benjamin that I wanted to talk about. This is 
Finding Home number 80 and from 2006. And all of, as you can see, all of Benjamin's Liliths have this beautiful turquoise blue skin. And this, this blue skin is a reference to otherness. Benjamin has appropriated the color blue. It's her call, calling card. She says, blue like me. Blue is a symbol of being other. And, these, and being a woman is other as well. So also blue references the sun and the, you know, sorry, the sky and the ocean. It's a very universal color. So all of her figures are colored blue. And this particular finding home is that we have um, Lilith written on the bottom there that's in Hindi. And she's standing amid a plume of red and this faultless blue sky. And there's a dove on the top right who's red. And Lilith has been pierced by an arrow, which is a reference to Saint Sebastian, who was a Christian martyr who was killed by an arrow. And up top, we have not a speech bubble like earlier, but just words. Then to the amazement of all, there arose from the fire a blue maiden wafting the fragrance of lotuses in bloom. We have a lot of cultures that are being referenced here because she also is wearing a talus again, the Jewish prayer shawl. So, but this suffering Lilith, this martyred Lilith will not stand idly by. You can see she's got a gun and a holster and this time she's gonna stand up for herself. She's an empowered woman. And that dove on the top right is meant to lead her to a place of intolerance and strife. Benjamin is actively at work. She made a beautiful um, Megillah, you know, Megillah of Esther um, that is enormous. She has decorated synagogues. She makes, you know, she paints a lot. And she actually, what's interesting is that she paints in a, with a um, paint called gouache. She slowly builds up layers to create this kind of gorgeous, vibrant work. And so the, we've just looked at a few female artists and a few moments in this, you know, this uprising of women during the feminist art movement and what happened to Edmonia Lewis. And part of the feminist art movement is unearthing, finding those women of the past that we didn't know about. And then we have women like Benjamin who are the beneficiaries of a 21st century art world that Judy Chicago and Audrey Flack helped open up for Benjamin. And yes, women are still underrepresented in the art world. Um, they're not treated equally, but because of RBG, just to come back to RBG and her efforts and so many others, gender is not seen so much as a limitation. We have made great strides and the work of female artists so long undervalued is finally starting to get its due. So thank you. And I am very glad to take questions. Thank you so much, Samantha. What a fascinating lecture. So to start it off, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. And as Samantha's answering these, you can feel free to keep sending in your questions either in the chat, send them to all panelists or using the Q&A function specifically. So the first question I wanted to ask you today, Samantha, actually speaks to the last point you ended on about the way that women are still treated in the art world. Mm -hmm. And so um, if there is still this discrimination against marginalized artists, women or folks of other genders, um, how can the public support female artists more? Are there any groups or websites that we can go to to learn more about these artists or how to support them and acquire their work? Okay, that's a great, that's a great question. So for example, Benjamin has a website that's fantastic. Would you like me to take the work down and just have my face? That would be great, yeah. Okay. Um, there we go. All right, so she, you can go to Benjamin's website and simply look to buy her work. She has, she has everything listed, that's, that's important. But I actually got an email yesterday, the day before that Wikipedia is having a, um, like a marathon of sorts to like fix female women, um, women entries. And also they're trying to get more women entries, female entries into Wikipedia. So it came in my email, I don't know, it's like sometime soon, but whether you're involved in that or not to anyone I'm talking to, 
then you can just go and write a Wikipedia entry and it has to be accepted, but like in Edmonia Lewis, of course, is in there and Audrey Flack. I don't know if Siona Benjamin has a Wikipedia page and maybe I'll do that tonight if she doesn't. But those are ways that you can make a difference and yes, support female artists, go to galleries, look at female art because they need that extra support. There's also some good books. So there's a book by Whitney Chadwick that's the classic called Women Art and Society. And I really recommend that just to like get an introduction to female artists. I just mentioned a few. There are a lot of fabulous female artists that deserve to be talked about. And at my university, we have a professor who teach women, teaches a women in art semester class. And it's very worthy of a semester or even a year. Fantastic, thank you. I have another question for you about the work of Siona Benjamin specifically and her focus on Lilith. And so in one of the pieces that you showed, it looks like there's a bullet that entered her. Mm -hmm. You used the word target when you spoke about the piece. Mm -hmm. And so um, our member of the audience is wondering if perhaps there's a literal interpretation of that that you see across, the th across all of Benjamin's work, but of women as targets. So that's something that really interests her. So that is something that her work is about. And she sees women as targets and she does use Kind, those kinds of weapons, whether it be a, an arrow or a bullet, she does feel that women are targeted. She feels that, you know, women of color are targeted. You know, she crosses over so many challenging, you know, places of her identity. She's a woman of color, she's Jewish, she's a woman. And so, yes, this idea of women being targeted is essential to her work. She takes biblical figures and delves into that. If you go to her website, which I believe is artsiona.com, so Siona, S-I-O-N-A, then you can look at the entire Fereshti series. You can look at lots of other work. She has a Liberty series in which she addresses Emma Lazarus's poem in relationship to um, women in her paintings. And she has you know, vastly different styles depending on what she's up to. So I really recommend doing that. Audrey Flack has a website. I don't believe you can buy art on her website, but she's represented by, um, I think some works on the Lewis Maisel gallery are for sale, paintings that she made. And of course, my dream is to own Audrey Fleck paintings someday. Wonderful, thank you. This is going to be a bit of a pivot from just the work of only Siona Benjamin, but more broadly across the four. Mm -hmm. But do you see any themes that are consistent across the body of work of all four of these artists? Okay, so. A well, we can see a consistent theme is an interest in women, depicting women. So let's, you know, Edmonia Lewis, we looked at Hagar, but she also, she would, um, and Cleopatra, but she was interested in other women. She was actually interested in the Song of Hiawatha by um, Longfellow, and she showed different aspects of that story in marble. Um, but yes, these, these women are interested in depicting women in vastly different media. Right? We've looked at several different media. I tried to you know, spread that across. You know, we have a multimedia installation by Judy Chicago or Audrey Flex paintings, and we have some sculpture. And so the, the theme, there is a theme of women, but we don't want to, um, we don't want to stereotype. They do lots of other kinds of work too. And while they're trying to highlight the female experience, we shouldn't just place them, we shouldn't ghettoize these artists as feminist artists. They do vastly good work. Let's look at their style. We don't ghettoize male artists for painting women all the time. So we need to sort of look at them within the larger scheme. Yes, they're women. Let's look at what they do for women. Let's look, about, look at what they say about women. But what else are they more broadly? They're great artists. Are there any themes that you've noticed in your own research that connect these four artists or even just two or three of them outside of the idea of womanhood as a central lens? Well, okay, so connecting them, I, so my special, I'm not a, I, I write about women artists, but my specialty, specialty is Jewish American art. So I can say that a unifying theme among Jewish American artists, so that include today Flack, and Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro, who worked with Chicago, as I mentioned, and Siona Benjamin, and Helen Frankenthaler, who was an abstract expressionist, is another example. Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock's wife, was a great artist, but she's always been subsumed under Jackson Pollock. You know, everybody knows Pollock, 
but not so much Lee Krasner. Though in the Cleveland Museum of Art, we have a terrific Lee Krasner painting, way better than the Pollock we have. And so what I would say about these Jewish American female artists is that a lot of them, like Judy Chicago, look backwards and say, my Jewishness made me want to make works about female, female, the female experience. They, a lot of them grasp on to tikkun olam. Benjamin specifically says, tikkun olam influences my art. Audrey Flack specifically says, my Jewish experience made me want to highlight Jewish themes in my art. So Jewish fe feminine themes in my art. So that Jewish experience really was embedded in a lot of the consciousness of our Jewish American artists. And there's, you know, there's been some scholarship about the importance of tikkun olam, the heel of the world, on both Jewish male and female artists. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting unifying theme. I mean, Edmonia Lewis stands out as you know, completely sui generis. I mean, she is so unique and so incredible. There were a few other female um, sculptors, 19th century American sculptors in Rome and Harriet Hosmer's another that you know, needs to have more attention on what she's done. Fantastic, really illuminating answer. Thank you. Um, to spin off very briefly into Lewis, we have another question from the audience specifically mm -hmm. about Lewis's career. Mm -hmm. And so this audience member noted that some of the faces in the sculptures that you showed look very traditionally white in their features. Do you think that that would have been a strategic decision to appeal to a white moneyed audience or just a factor of the times that Lewis was working in? Okay, so that actually is part of the body of like the discussion about her. Mm -hmm. So when she made Hagar, so Hagar was Egyptian, so she could have the, um, the features of another, but Lewis very specifically gave her, you know, white features because she didn't want the sculpture to be read in relationship to she, Lewis's other identity. So she's very specifically not showing her figures as other. And so that, that's, and she was critic. So some critics, she, she really suffered at the hands of critics in her day. Some critics said that her, there was irony in the fact that this, this black woman was paint, was um, sculpting, you know, using the medium that was so white, so, you know, glaringly white and so traditional and so traditionally male. So she, one, one critics, you know, commented on the Negress who worked in white marble and he was very negative about her work as if she shouldn't be doing it because she's not white and because she's a woman. I had no idea that that was the conversation around Lewis's career. So thank you for explaining that. And then if you have time, we have one last question for you today, Samantha. Yes. So I was very curious listening as you spoke about the role of collaboration between women and the careers of so many of these artists, particularly with Chicago's The Dinner Party, but also with the Gorilla Girls you spoke about earlier in the lecture. And so I was wondering, could you speak to the role of collaboration between women, if it did play a role in the careers of Black, Benjamin, or Lewis? All right, so the, the collaborative nature of The Dinner Party actually received some criticism. So some critics said, well, Judy Chicago is acting like the master of a studio, just like Rembrandt acted like the, was, was the master of a studio or Raphael was the master of a studio. And I think she was you know, emboldening women and giving them opportunities and not excluding men at the same time. There's a documentary film about the dinner party and the making of it that I highly recommend to anybody who wants to know more about that workshop pro, um, process. So Chicago opened up opportunities. Her collaboration with Miriam Shapiro was groundbreaking for the feminist art movement. Um, I, there are groups who, female groups of artists who support each other, same with writers in the 21st century. Flack did not have anyone to collaborate with as far as with her photorealist peers because she had no um, women to work with. But in the more current day, two of the you know, major photorealist artists she's good friends with, like Richard Estes, who I showed you the work, um, and Sonia um, Reflections, and she knows Chuck Close. I mean, they've been working 
in the same kind of style, that, you know, this gorgeous way of painting for so long. So she's had that aspect, but in general, there's not a lot of collaboration. Um, Judy Chicago's dinner party was um, incredibly original and did make it, it made a huge dent in difference in the art world. That's incredibly interesting. Thank you. And so Samantha, thank you so much for your time today and for answering all of our questions. And I would also like to thank everybody and our audience for joining us today from home for this program. We are so glad to have you with us. And we are so glad that we were able to share Samantha's research with you and her lecture today. So if you would, if you enjoyed the program today, we hope that you join us again next month for the next installment in the Women Who Roar series, when Mandy Smith from the Cleveland Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will be talking to us about women who roar in music. Um, speaking on some women who are actually in the rock halls, rock hall, rock and roll, rock and roll hall of fame, excuse me. And um, you can find out more information on these programs and others by visiting our website, www.maltzmuseum.org. Thank you again, Samantha, for your time tonight. And thank you all for joining us. Have a really great evening. Thanks, Emma.